Well, I like to watch these shows, renovation shows, or just anybody do a renovation in general, but typically the really good renovation shows, they capture, they've gotten really good at capturing the process. And usually it starts with some kind of demo day or demolition where they're taking this house that needs to be renovated and getting it down to the studs, getting rid of everything that's old needs to go, and, and they get it ready to start building up from there. And then they're putting together the foundational elements. There's getting structural support in place. Typically they're finding things they maybe didn't know about, stuff that needs to be redone in the plumbing or the electric or whatever might need to be done. And, and without those things, you couldn't live in the home. But then they get into the next step, which is really the finishing touch, the thing that makes it look so good and why you wait for that final walkthrough when there's that aha moment and what they've done design-wise. When they start putting on the paint, they start to hang up the different uh, fixtures that go along with the design theme of the home. They start uh, putting the siding on the outside, putting in the landscaping and bringing it all together. And at the end, you look at that and go, that is a beautiful home. But you think back to the foundational elements. Imagine if they did that first. Imagine if they went in and they just put all the new paint and siding on. And some people do flip houses like this and people don't realize until they've lived in it for a little while that it was done poorly. You put all the lipstick and makeup on the house and make it look good but internally it still needs new electric. It still needs better plumbing, new plumbing. It still has some problems with the most foundational elements of the home and it really isn't livable at that point. And you wouldn't want to just bring it down to the studs and do all the foundational elements and then not put the paint on and put the fixtures in and make it livable, put the flooring in and bring in furniture. That would be a difficult house to live in as well. They're not mutually exclusive, but you certainly, if you had to pick one, You'd certainly want good plumbing and electric. You'd want those foundational elements to come first and to be the things that were there, no matter what. And when we think about the Lord's Prayer and going into part two, the second half, really, of these requests or this prayer coming before the Lord, it's a good reminder, even breaking it up like this, that we never want to start here without going to the foundation, without going to this starting point that Christ gives us of our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, or your will be done, your kingdom come. You know, I can't get that old Methodist prayer out of my head, right? Yeah. Thy, thy, thy. Our, you know, our Father who's in heaven. And we go on, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we get to this, this second part. But it, it, the, the second part of the prayer is really brought to life by the foundation in which we've already prayed. And we need to remember that going into this. Because I think so often, which we talked about last week, we start here. We sit down and we start here and we start walking through our daily bread needs, our, our daily needs, uh, the things that probably cause us the most pain, quite honestly, and what draws us to pray most times. And so we need to remember, even though the things that are causing us pain or discomfort, they might be drawing us into pray, we need to remember that we still need to start with what we've already learned in the previous week. <coughs> If we're faithful to put God first and seek His face more than His hand, like we talked about, above all things, then we'll, we'll come fully prepared to ask Him for things like our material needs, our forgiveness, or our protection, which is really what we're going to walk through here. It puts, the perspec it puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? When you've done those things, you've gone before the Lord and you've praised His name, and you've requested His will above yours, it really starts to create a filter in which we pray these prayers that we're going to walk through here. And I want to give you a reminder on what my goal is for this class, which I hope you would partake in this goal with me, but that all of us would experience personal revival by shifting our perspective and practice of prayer closer to what God intends it to be. So if that's us, we go before the Lord and we're so tempted to just bring up our temporal requests, things He says to pray for, but we go there first. Maybe we would have that shift happen in our lives and we would see personal revival by experiencing that. We want to go from a me-focused mentality to a God-focused mentality. And in our practice, we want to follow the pattern God has given us in Scripture for prayer as a template. And we want to pray in the power of the Scriptures themselves. We don't leave no beat on the bone when it comes to prayer. That, that's the goal of this class and of our lives, ultimately. So let's jump in. This first request, give us this day our daily bread. It's really the first time that we focused on ourselves if you look at the Lord's Prayer. We've talked about praising God's name, worshiping Him. We've talked about His kingdom, and we talked about His will. And now we get to the first request 
that has anything to do with us. And I want to have you keep three things in mind as we enter into this section of the Lord's Prayer. First, God knows every need. He knows every need. He tells us this in this passage. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So that's comforting. God knows what we need. Some people might say, well, then why pray at all? We already went into that in the first week. Why pray at all? Well, there's a lot of reasons that God gives us. We want to, first of all, praise Him and honor Him. We want to grow our need and grow our faith in Him. And it's out of an act of obedience. There's many other reasons why we go to Him, but we, we should be comforted by the fact that He knows what we need before we ask Him. And then God is able to meet every need. So He knows every need. He's able to meet every need. Ephesians 3.20, Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. And then God will supply every need. Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So this gives us confidence to come before the Lord here, to ask for our needs. Perhaps you believe those things, but maybe you've become so familiar with God's provision that you lose sight of just how miraculous it is. I, I know I'm guilty of this, that the normal everyday things that I just take for granted, that God actually miraculously provides for me, they, they start to fade into the background or just I take them for granted. And you know what that creates? discontentment when they're taken away because I now think that I deserve these things or they were just always there or that's just part of being alive and what we need to do is say no it's a miraculous gift of God by his grace every time we receive anything I like the way this is put by Warren Wiersbe he says think of it it requires the cooperation of our universe for us to have a piece of bread the Lord launched planet Earth in just the right orbit around the sun, tilted it carefully, and gave it just the right atmosphere, soils, and amounts of sunlight to sustain human life as we know it. A loaf of bread begins with little seeds of wheat or some other grain that are planted and cultivated and at the right time harvested. The Lord sends the necessary sunshine and rain so that the seeds take root and grow. It requires a combination of the faithfulness and blessing of the Father as well as the skills and hard work of the farmers, millers, and bakers to give us a loaf of bread. We hold in our hands a miracle that too often we take for granted. That's just a loaf of bread, thinking about all that it takes for that to arrive on our table. It is really miraculous when we think about it. And as we unpack this part of the Lord's Prayer, I want to make sure we spend some time focusing on this word daily as well. I think that's an important part of this prayer. God wants us to come to Him daily for our needs. Each day presents specific needs, and so it should present specific requests. And when we come to the Lord daily, we grow in our dependence of Him through a habit of neediness. Neediness is a key component to, the, to a good prayer life. And we're repeatedly coming to the Lord and agreeing with John 15, 5, which says, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Apart from me you can do nothing. You can't provide for yourself a loaf of bread. You can't ultimately provide what only God can provide through Him being the creator and the sustainer of all life. But there's another way to think about this. Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. See, praying for our daily bread can be like the blinders that uh, you know, a rider puts on the horse. When we pray for our daily bread, these Binders, these blinders for a horse are there to remove distractions and to help the horse focus on what's in front of them and the task at hand. And I think praying for our daily bread, for our daily needs, are like the Christian's blinders to not get caught up in two weeks from now, to not get caught up in tomorrow. For we can do nothing, the Bible says, by worrying about tomorrow. We can add nothing to tomorrow. We need these blinders every day to pray for our daily bread. We need, we need to pray, we need the blinders on so we don't start praying for next week's bread and, and the next week's bread or hey this thing's coming down the line in six months and I'm anxious the whole time and, and, and many different poets and writers have said the same thing I mean the, the truth is worrying about the thing that's coming in two weeks and four months from now whether that's a surgery or some kind of meeting or some conflict resolution or whatever it might be in your life 
the worrying about it is always more dramatic than the actual doing of it, is it not? And, and God has provided us the ability to blind us from that, to say, hey, I'll take care of you. I'll give you the grace needed when that time comes. We don't get ahead of ourselves when we pray like this. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. We may not even be around for that thing that we're worrying about. Lord, let me focus on the daily needs that I have in my life. Let me come to you for those. And it forms this protection around our life and our thought life. The prayer, give us this day our daily bread, should almost always be paired with a prayer that goes something like, give us this day more faith. That's what we're saying. Give, give me the faith that I need, Lord, to believe in your provision, in your daily provision. Praying for provision from God is as much about having faith as it is about asking for what we need. God shows us a great example of this principle by showcasing a unique situation that the Israelites found themselves in the wilderness. We all know the story of them being there and the manna that was provided for them. See, we can drive a short distance, at least I would imagine most of us, at least right now in the world that we live in, we can drive a short distance to find and acquire what we need to eat. That wasn't the case for the Israelites. And that may be the case at some point in our life. We just don't know. But for them, for the Israelites, and even for the early church, they didn't have the conveniences that we have. And, and again, oftentimes, I don't know if that's a good thing for us spiritually because we get so used to these things just being available that we don't pray for them anymore. Well, I'm not going to pray for my daily needs. I looked in the fridge and there's stuff in there. I looked in the pantry and there's stuff in there. No, we need to rely on the Lord just as much as if we were waking up like the Israelites wondering if this manna had come down again. When we are in situations where our needs are out of reach, we should remember that the story is about God's faithfulness. That's what it's about. So that we can grow our faith like the Israelites did. That, that's what we're doing here. Exodus 16, 16 through 21, is a little bit about this. Is, is talking about this, this situation that he put them in. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, he's talking about the manna, each one of you, as much as he can eat, you shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. Get basically, gather up as much as you need based on the actual needs of, of the size of your people, of your family. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. Just this amazing rhythm that God had created for the Israelites to learn to trust Him and to learn to trust only Him for their provision. I mean, you think about the system. You, you can't go any, you get backed into a corner to realize only God is the provider. I mean, some families gathered more because they had more people. Well, that didn't rot, but some families who had less had no need. But if this family gathered the same amount as that family, it would have rotted. They would have had too much left over. And then there's the, the miracle of you know, on the weekend, gather twice as much because we're not going to go out and do it on the Sabbath. And it didn't rot. This is God showing that I am the provider. I'm the one who sustains all of this. And I can make it do what I want to make it do. And this should grow our faith as we see something like this happen in the life of the Israelites. God wants us to pray for our daily bread. We need to think of it as a daily need. We must acknowledge our dependence on God often. We're so prone to forget that we are dependent on God for everything. Depending on God brings Him glory and grows our trust in Him. Going back to the whole reason why we started praying in the first place, hallowed be thy name. And praying in this way, this idea for daily bread, and depending on God in this way, reminds us that our Father cares for us as well. God wants to provide for us. We see Jesus have compassion on the crowds and feed them in the New Testament. You know, two of his greatest miracles were feeding great crowds of people. I mean, this is important to God to provide for the needs 
of people. And food is important to God. I mean, even Christ, he, he, you see God not wanting to waste. Christ gathered up the remainder. And how, how good is God to provide in a way that there's, there's plenty for everyone all the time? I see two kind of broader enemies to praying in this way, this idea of, of daily needs being expressed to God. Um, sometimes Christians can start to worship their own ability to provide. That's an enemy, I think, of praying in this way. We can start to read our own press and be so impressed with our ability to go out and to make a living or to be good at a job. We should have pride in our work in the sense that we take great pride in it, but we should never lose sight of the fact that God gave us the mind, the hands, the feet, the body to go do that work. And that's a form of his providing the daily bread that he gives to us. And I think it's something that we probably all struggled with at one time or another. When we, uh, we find our, we're good at something or we've accomplished something, there's always the flesh there to remind us that, or to try to pull us toward uh, self-glorification. See, my prayer life, I'll just be honest with you, changed immensely when my perspective shifted early in my business career. And I'll just be vulnerable with you. This was years and years ago. Uh, I ran my own business for a long time before I had I stepped into full-time pastoral ministry. And I remember in those early years, probably in the first five years of running my business, we would go on vacations and I would have panic attacks on vacation. I would be so wrought with anxiety and stress. Vacations were the worst because what I tried to do on vacations was simultaneously rest and still work, which is the worst thing you can do. It's almost better to just keep working and not try to do that. And the reason I do that is because I didn't trust the Lord. I didn't pray to God on a daily basis for my daily needs. I thought I was the provider and I needed to provide in my own strength. And so I had to learn that lesson the hard way over and over again. This would happen. And finally, God broke me. He broke me and humbled me in a way where I came before him on my knees and crying out to him, Lord, you are the God who provides. I'm not the provider. I have a complete dependence on you. And however you choose to provide, I will trust you. I remember, you know, I used to get all worked up. Our, our business would have to, you know, clear a certain amount of sales or a certain amount of uh, billables coming in, you know, to make payroll and all those things. And I remember after this change happened in my life, and I was praying more regularly and trusting the Lord. There was, you know, we needed something like 200 grand in a week or else we weren't going to be able to make uh, payroll, which is the worst thing to miss because then you have employees who are not getting paid and that's not something you want to deal with. And I had no anxiety about it. And that was only because God had changed me through the power of prayer to rely on Him, to come before Him and say, hey, I've worked hard. I've done everything I can do. I'm praying regularly to God, trusting Him in His provision. I'm praying for my daily needs. You know what? Next week is a long ways away. There's like seven days where God could provide all kinds of things and solutions. Or I lose the business and then I go do something else and that was God's will. Whatever. You know, I'm not going to sit here and I'm going to worry about it. And the old me would look at that and be like, you're nuts. How can you possibly say that? Well, the, you know, the new me being renewed through prayer and trusting in God in this way was seeing it for what it really was the whole time. There was nothing I was doing. I wasn't really changing anything. The situation didn't change. As we say oftentimes from the pulpit, you don't need a change in circumstances. You need a change in perspective. And praying in this way is what changes your perspective. That's what you need to do is change your perspective by praying for God's daily provision. And, and who knows what's going to happen in, in this world. We could end up being in a tough spot here in the next several years with what's going on in the world and with leadership and everything else. But there's one, this room, out of anybody else, this church, out of anybody else on the planet, should not have anxiety, should not be running around trying to find where we're going to get our next meal from because we're going to pray to the God who provides. That should be how we practice for times like that. And uh, again, Pastor Ben, he just recommended reading biographies. Read biographies. Read biographies of great men and women who have had to provide every, they've had to rely on the Lord to provide every meal while they're in a prison cell or they're being persecuted, or they're, whatever's going on. And the faith that they have through this, you know, this prayer brings encouragement to them. And that's what we need to, to, to live in as well. So there's, there's that side of things, where there's the subtle enemy of, I, I'm, I'm the Lord of my life, I'm providing, and I'm relying on myself. But then there's, I think, a more subtle enemy 
to praying like this. Uh, on the flip side, I think Christians can practice asceticism, which goes against the preacher's word in Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 9. It says, Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. So we need to not just uh, say, Lord, you know what? I want to be poor and I want to not have meals and I want to just be more spiritual in my uh, suffering. Like that's not, a, that's not a mindset we should have either. And oftentimes I think that mindset can can say, well, I'm not going to go pray for my daily needs because there's a lot of other daily needs that people have and I don't want to burden the Lord. Well, the Lord can answer all those prayers at the same time. He can provide for everyone. That's not the point of prayer. So we need to make sure that we don't get slip into that. And it can happen subtly where we just, woes me. Self-pity is one of the most evil forms of pride in the life of a Christian. So we need to avoid that because it's a really a focus on ourselves saying, well, I ultimately, do, I, I should have, you know, something different than what I have, but I don't, so I'm kind of downtrodden and I'm downcast. And, and sometimes we like that. We like the attention. It's kind of like, well, you know, the guy who gets a broken ankle and has crutches walking around the school, they like the attention a little bit on themselves when it comes to that. And I think in the Christian life, we can, we can like that a little too much sometimes. So praying regularly for our daily bread is similar to praying the prayer we find in Proverbs 38 and 9. I, I, before I read this, I want to ask you, do you have the guts to pray this prayer? This prayer takes some guts because all of us like nice things. All of us, if we're honest, would rather have more money than less. But look at what this prayer exposes in the heart of, of, uh, of Solomon and, and, and what we should ultimately be praying here as somebody who comes before the Lord. Remove from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Lord, I just want to be an average person when it comes to what I have. I just want to have my needs met. I don't want to be rich, lest I forget you. And I don't want to be in poverty, lest I'm tempted to go and to steal. This is a bold prayer that I'd recommend thinking about. Because this is, this is going to be good for your soul. This is going to be good for you. And, and at the end of the day, God does bless some people with wealth. And praise God, that's how we're going to build a building eventually, right? And some people have wealth that they can give and they can steward well. But we know that even from other areas in Scripture that it's difficult for a rich man to enter heaven. It's very distracting. It becomes a God of its own, an idol. And uh, that was my problem when I was in business, is that I, I really I had an idea of what I should be, what I should have. And I, I didn't consult God on that. I wanted to just kind of go with, the, with what I thought was best. But this is, uh, I think, really associated with this idea of my daily bread. Because we need to get right what a real need is in our lives. We oftentimes get that mixed up a little bit. We think something that we want is, is an actual need. But we need to lay that before the feet of Christ and really uh, have Him tell us what our needs are. And in a real sense, we talked a lot about food or provision in that way, but th this prayer isn't just for food. This is for our, our needs. This is for much more than just our food. This is an opportunity to come before the Lord for what we feel is a necessity. Maybe a, a new car. My car's breaking down and I won't be able to you know, get to my job or get to uh, church or other things that I should. Uh, Lord, I, I really pray that you'd provide a new car, a, a home, a, a building for the church. We, we prayed this morning. We prayed for uh, a lot of other things first, we, we actually used the model of the Lord's Prayer at the boiler room, but we got to eventually pray for a, a, a full-time facility for the church. That's something we're going to pray for because only God can provide that. Or you might be praying for a job. God tells you, you know, especially um, the men in the room to go provide and to work. And, and, and women, you may be in a position where you can go work. And, and that's something that's open to you and it's something your family needs. And you guys are praying for a job. And, and that's okay to pray for, to pray for God to provide through a job. And uh, it's not just for us. This is an important point in the prayer, in the rhythm of praying, where we start to pray intercessory prayers for other people's daily bread, for their needs. We should take this time to pray for the needs of others as well. This prayer should also come with another request that is related, um, to trust the Lord 
when what he provides is different than our requests. That's, that's got to be a, almost a sister or a prayer to this prayer. Lord, I pray for my daily needs, but, but I also want to almost like so, have a sidecar prayer attached to that prayer of, and help me to trust you when you answer this differently than what I had in my mind. You bring the job I didn't really want. You, you, you bring provision in a way that I, 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 you know, I, wish, I, I wish I had something else to eat you know, or whatever it might be. We need to make sure we're preparing our hearts for that. Lord, give me the heart to respond well to however you provide. And praying this prayer in faith in some way should be like checking a box. I mean, we don't, usually when we say checking a box, we think of that as a bad thing. But let me ask you this. When you have a list of tasks to do, and some of you might have some of those to do later today in your home, is there not great peace that comes from checking one of those tasks off? And if you have a certain task uh, software, it might even cross it out for you when you check it off and it's like, oh, I don't have to think about that anymore. That feels great. And I think in that sense, yeah, we're checking a box off here where we pray for these things. When we pray for our daily bread, think about it this way. When we, we, we pray for our daily bread, we know that our Father in heaven hears us. He's heard us. We know that he's capable of providing. We know that he's good and we know that he knows what's best. So when we pray this prayer, we can Check it off in our minds. I prayed the prayer. God's now going to do what God's going to do. I don't need to now try to figure it out. We can put it away. We can close the laptop. We can shut down the anxiety. We have to have that mental picture of, I prayed this prayer, and I'm going to push it over here. Because what's going to happen is if I let that kind of just stay in my mind and, and mull it over, over and over again, you know what that's going to do? It's going to affect how I can go and serve in the other areas of my life. I'm not going to be able to go and to serve my wife or my husband or my children or the church because I'm going to be thinking about, hey, I prayed this, prayed this prayer, but I'm not sure God's got it. I'm not sure if he doesn't need my help. Oftentimes we pray for our needs, but then you think about it like, you know, bad analogy, but we're, we're on a phone call with God asking him for our needs and then we hang up the call, and then we go try to get it done our way. You know, we need to think, if I, had a, if I had a father who had endless amounts of money, and I called him and I said, hey, hey, Dad, I, I, just, uh, I could use some help. You know, we, we need some help here. If you could just send some money for groceries. And I knew my dad loved me, and I knew he uh, was always uh, consistent in his character. I mean, think about that from a human perspective. If I hung up the phone, I would not give it one more thought. I would think, my dad's going to send that. He's going to send it. I'm going to open up my bank account. I'm going to see the wire in there or the transfer or a check in the mail. And it's as good as done. And I think we have to think more like that with the Lord, that we've come before him and it may not happen exactly the way that we think it's going to happen or the way we want it to happen, but we've made our request before the Lord. Not only that, but if we you know, mucked it up when we were doing that, the Holy Spirit's there to interpret what our heart really is and what those prayers really are. And God's going to answer those prayers. So that's, that's one way to think about it. Kind of hitch that sidecar there. Hey, Lord, you've taken care of this. You've heard me. I'm not going to sit here and grind on this anymore. I think a lot of our anxiety in life comes from that, where we don't quite trust that the Lord has heard us or that he's good or that he's going to answer. Now let's move on and forgive us our debts. When we're forgiven by Christ, which really is this word you hear often in church, justified, made legally right, reconciled before the Lord. Isn't our debt forgiven? And so you'd say, well, yes, all of our debt is forgiven. All past debt, present debt, future debt. Christ cried out, it is finished on the cross. We don't have to earn any part of our sal salvation. But then that begs the question, which is, a, I think, an honest question, then why should we repeatedly come back with a prayer like this and forgive us our debts? Well, God already forgave us our debts. Why do we have to ask Him this? Well, because Scripture is also clear that we're to confess our sins. We're to come back to God and say, I agree with the fact that I'm sinning against you, Lord. And so this prayer should ultimately be kind of a duality here of, Lord, I, I need forgiveness for the sin I just committed, but you have forgiven me, so I'm going to be grateful for the gospel and for who Jesus Christ is and how I am your child. Um, Although we're justified, we aren't perfect, and we'll all say an amen to that. So as we continue in sin, we need to pray to God for forgiveness. 
you know, my son, he'll never stop being my son, both of my sons, but I'm thinking about my older son, who's a really a young man, and he's starting to live life more closely resembling a life like mine, and uh, I, I'm not going to ever stop loving my son. He's never going to stop being my son. But when he sins against me, our relationship isn't what it should be. It's not full. It's not complete. It's not what it should be until he apologizes and asks for forgiveness. And, and in those moments, we grow in our relationship together. And as children of God, we need to come before the Lord and say, hey, I've offended you as a holy God. I need to be reconciled to you in, in, in a more temporal sense. So we need to have that in mind when we come with this prayer. This prayer is, is why we need to sit under good biblical preaching. We need to sit under good biblical preaching that convicts us. If you sit in Pastor Ben's sermons week after week and you never feel any conviction, well, that's a problem because we need to be convicted by the Word of God and, and for the sin in our lives to be revealed so that we can confess it before the Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Pray for God to reveal it to our, us in our heart. You know, Psalm, I always go to Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, that great prayer of, Lord, search my heart, see if there be any grievous way in me. You know, Lord, open me up. Show me the stuff I don't want to see. We could also go to a spouse and say, hey, is there anything in me that you see that I need to repent of? Anything that you think is maybe even flirting with sin or something that you're not comfortable with or whatever it might be these people in our lives i think goes really well along with the sermon we just heard that we need to have surround ourselves in all areas of life with people who are imitatable people that also can uh, reflect the scriptures back in our life and we can go oh i've fallen short in this area i need to repent and confess we need to listen to our conscience uh, more and more that we need to we need to listen to our conscience because God uses our conscience along with wise counsel to reveal to us places where we feel guilty. And godly grief, it leads to repentance, the scriptures say. Worldly grief leads to death. Are we just sad because we got caught or are we really concerned with our status with, with our Father who's holy? And then we let the Word of God read us. Right? We, we get into the Word of God, but we should be convicted in our daily Bible reading. And if we're never convicted by our daily Bible reading, then we're not letting the Word of God read us and really show us where we have fallen short and we need to ask for forgiveness. But quickly, I want to move on to as we also have forgiven our debtors because this is really, I think, the crux of the first part of that prayer. You know, it, if our Father's desire is to conform us to the image of His Son, Romans 8.29, then the act of forgiving others is the greatest form of imitation. That really is where the rubber meets the road for the Christian, is how well you forgive others. When we're saved by the blood of Christ, when we are forgiven much, we are expected to forgive. That is what we are expected to do as children of God. This is a part of the prayer when we remember just how much we've been forgiven. You need to praise God for saving you, a wretched, undeserving sinner, by His mercy and grace. And so we need to keep the parable of the unforgiving servant in mind. I think that's a great place to start. Turn with me to Matthew 18, verse 21. I find it interesting that Matthew 18 is typically the place that we go to with, hey, that guy's sitting in the church. We need to go Matthew 18 him. We need to go confront him. And yes, we should. That's, the scriptures are there for us to follow. And there's a pattern here. We should go and confront someone in a rescue mission to rescue them from their sin. But the most famous part of Matthew 18 is this pattern or this process to see church discipline played out. But I find it interesting that right here we have the parable of the unforgiving servant right right in the same area where really what it comes down to is having our own hearts right and making sure that we are forgiving much because we are forgiven much. It says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, again, we learned about what the kingdom of heaven is, so it's interesting here we see the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife 
and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. You see, before I go on, that debt was, he could have never paid that off in his entire lifetime. You know, we don't need to get into exactly how much that would be the equivalent of today, but just know that that's, that's so much that he could never forgive it. He could never pay it off in a lifetime. So starting again in verse 28, but when that same servant went out, so he's been forgiven something that was going to crush him under the weight of it for the rest of his life. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, and that amount, by the way, is something that could be paid off. It's not something that would take a lifetime to pay off. It's still a decent amount, but it's definitely much, much less than what he had just been forgiven. He began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, just like the other guy. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And how long is it going to take for us to pay off our debt? There's no right answer to that. For we, we can try to pay off our debt for all eternity as a finite creature who sinned against a holy, infinite God. That's why punishment for sin has to have an eternal weight to it. And so we, we see this, and we should immediately be struck by how much we've been forgiven. With a statement this bold, this serious, we should seek to understand forgiveness and understand what it means to forgive of others so that we can pray this prayer with a genuine confidence and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Can we say that to the Lord confidently and with a clear conscience? I have forgiven my debtors. It, it may be a good habit to recall this passage, this Matthew 18, 21 through 25 passage, each time that you get to this section of the Lord's Prayer, just to recall to protect our hearts against this type of behavior ourselves, Because when we're offended by others, we're going to have the temptation to be like this unforgiving servant. We've probably all been tempted to live in this way. When someone has really done something against us that's very offensive, and the rest of the world would say, yeah, what they did to you is wrong and they need to be punished for it. We need to remember, no, what I did was eternally wrong and God forgave me by sending His only Son to the cross. And since a lack of forgiveness is the most antithetical posture to the life of a regenerate Christian, this should be very important to us. What does Jesus say after he teaches his disciples to pray in Matthew 6? We read this on day one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Being a forgiving person is a fruit of of being a regenerate Christian. Colossians 3.13 says, Bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. If forgiveness is such an important topic, and it really is the hinge that the whole Lord's Prayer swings on, that's what I'm seeing here, is that, hey, I'm going to come before the Lord, and I'm going to praise Him, I'm going to seek His will, I'm going to seek His kingdom to come on this earth, I'm going to pray for my needs. But then I'm an unforgiving person? Am I really a child of God? Am I really living like my king? Do I need to repent for my unforgiveness? If it's really the hinge, then we should get this forgiveness business right. We should spend some time understanding what it means to forgive. So I want to take a few moments to walk you through what biblical forgiveness looks like. I've taken some principles directly from the book the Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. It's a great book. A lot of good principles in that book for biblical counseling and for conflict resolution as Christians. His story is incredible as to why he even started his Peacemaker ministry. But this book is helpful. And I've extracted directly from the book, as you'll see there in your notes, some things that you can take with you after this class is done. Some things that you could pull out again if you're dealing with conflict resolution. You're dealing with some somebody who you need to forgive or two people that need to forgive each other and you're helping them walk through that. 
Let's walk through these a little bit. It says we forgive even when we don't feel like it. Forgiveness is an act of the will in which we choose to forgive regardless of how we feel. We don't forget about what has happened, but we choose not to recall it. You know, God doesn't forget our sin. It's as far as the east is from the west, but God doesn't call to mind our sin. God has chosen, much like I would say, Christ had chosen to deny his deity. You know, Philippians 2, when he came to be living a life of fully man, he didn't access that power. But it didn't go away. He just chose to operate in that way. And God chooses not to recall our sin. And we don't recall it to ourselves, to others, to the offender. We don't excuse the offense, but we forgive despite the fact that it was a sin. And I think that's important for us to understand as well, because oftentimes we want our pound of flesh, and we feel like there's an injustice being done. Well, hey, God will have perfect justice executed, ultimately. We need to remember that. The Greek word to forgive is aphemai here, which means to let go, release, or remit. It often refers to a debt that has been paid or canceled in full. And forgiveness can't be earned and is undeserved. Forgiveness is something that costs the forgiving party a lot. I don't know if you recall, but Pastor Ben at one point, he was speaking about forgiveness uh, from uh, the main pulpit, and he said forgiveness feels like death. Forgiveness feels like death. When you're actually in a situation where someone has wronged you, maybe wronged a family member, I actually find it harder to forgive people that have hurt my wife. Because, you know, yeah, I care, I care a lot more about her, hopefully, than myself if I'm living the Christian. And the more that I grow in my Christian walk, the more I have a harder time with people who uh, mistreat my wife because right? I want to go and defend her honor, which is part of how I'm wired as her husband to go and, and to do that. But uh, I need to forgive them. And it feels like death. It feels like, you know, man, it's tempting to say I'm sweeping this under the rug. No, you're not. You're not denying that this was sin, but what you're doing is you're modeling Christ's forgiveness, and you ultimately know that God will have the, His way with them. And I'll get to it. I'll get here, get to the different types of forgiveness here in a moment, because there is di a difference between someone who's repentant and someone who's not. And I think that trips us up sometimes when we think about forgiveness. What about if the offender hasn't asked for forgiveness? Well, here we are, which is what I was talking about. Approach forgiveness in two parts. Part one: we need to have an attitude of forgiveness. There's a commitment you make to God and is unconditional. This will help you stand before the Lord in obedience, avoid bitterness, and have patience as you wait for the other party to repent. You can't have a fully reconciled relationship if the other party isn't repentant because you, you can't found that relationship on any truth. Right? There, there's not going to be that relationship that's broken by uh, humility. It, it's, there's still something there that needs to happen in their repentance if they've offended you. But... Uh, oftentimes what I see the mistake being made in this situation is, well, I'm not going to forgive them until they repent. No, that's not what Scripture says. I mean, Christ even cr cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Like Christ lived out this idea. He, he, he remained on the cross, even though none of the people doing to him what they were doing were repentant. He, he, he forgave. He wanted them to be forgiven. He wanted you and I to be forgiven. We were saved even when we were enemies of the Lord. He models this in the way that he operates with us. So we need to have this attitude of forgiveness, basically where we are going to operate like Christ. And we'll get into what that might look like here in a moment. But we also have the expectations. The relationship might not be what it once was until some other things happen. And that's the part two. We grant forgiveness in, in the true biblical sense. Once the offender confesses and repents, then you forgive them and make promises regarding your active choice to forgive them moving forward. There's these four promises of forgiveness. I will not dwell on the incident. I will not bring up this incident again and use it against you. I will not talk to others about this incident. I will not let the incident stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. I've seen far too many Christians say, yeah, I've forgiven them, but then betray that reality by what they talk about and who they talk about it with. And so this is a great thing for us to remember, even, again, when you're talking to friends and you can tell there's, there's a root of bitterness there. They really haven't moved on. They're still bringing it up. They're still operating out of some sort of offense that this person committed to them. Hey, maybe you haven't forgiven them because this thing keeps coming back up and you keep using it against them, either in private conversations or in your own heart or whatever it might be. And so that's helpful for us because when we pray this prayer, you know, forgive 
my debts as I've forgiven my debtors. We need to say that with confidence. We need to say, yeah, I have forgiven them. When we go to take communion, we need to be confident that there's nothing between us and another brother or sister that we need to go reconcile. And uh, this is important. I've, I've had this conversation with many people. If you're in that first camp where someone isn't repentant and, and the reconciliation hasn't quite happened yet, but you've come to them and you've processed it with them, you've maybe asked for forgiveness, you don't need to just forego taking communion forever if that person's not repentant. Right? You do what, the, the important part of what we're talking about there is you go do what you can do. As much as it depends on you, live at peace with others. But there's a certain point where you're like, I've done everything I can do. And I can stand before the Lord saying, I've been obedient to seek reconciliation and to forgive. And, and I can take communion confidently and biblically. So, because some people get hung up on that. Like, until we're right, you know, I can't go and take communion. Well, that's, that's a two-way street. You might be walking, you know, on your side of the street in confidence and biblically, but it takes the other person as well. And then here's a series of questions to help you apply the principles of forgiveness. These are great. These are great just to pull up once in a while and ask yourself, how has your opponent sinned against you? You know, is there anyone who has sinned against me that I'm not even, you know, I'm stuffing it deep and I'm not even wanting to think about it. Which of these sins has your opponent confessed? Which of the unconfessed sins can you overlook and forgive at this time? Overlooking offenses is a, should be a common pastime for every Christian. Overlooking offenses should be a common pastime for every Christian. Overlooking offenses should be a common pastime for every Christian. I'm just going to say it three times because it's that important. Because unity in the church depends on Christians overlooking offenses. Because there's going to be some stuff where you just got to go, you know what? Maybe they're immature. Maybe they're not seeing it yet. I'm going to pray for them. I need to overlook it. And, and so there are plenty of times when we fall into that category. And it says, it is, the, it is the glory of a man to overlook an offense, scriptures say. It is a glorious thing. Because it's a little bit of that dying, right? Yeah, I'm going to overlook that. I really think that they need to pay for that. No, I'm going to overlook it. Um, now write out the four promises, or sorry, make the first decision of forgiveness, admit that you cannot forgive on your own and ask God to change your heart. Now write out <coughs> the four promises that you'll make to your opponent at this time to indicate your forgiveness. What consequences of your opponent's sin will you take on yourself? Great question. What consequences will you expect your opponent to bear? You, you don't naturally think through all these things when you're going through a situation where you do need to forgive someone. And this is important to process through. Because they're, they're, your heart's good at hiding stuff. We need to draw it out by questions like this. If you're having a hard time forgiving your opponent, then it goes through this. Is it because you are not sure he or she has repented? If so, how could you encourage confirmation of repentance? Do you think your opponent must somehow earn or deserve your forgiveness? Are you trying to punish them by withholding forgiveness? Are you expecting a guarantee that the offense won't happen again? If you have any of these attitudes on expect or expectations, what do you need to do? How has your sin contributed to this problem? Read Matthew 18, 21 through 35. We just did. What has God forgiven you for in the past? How serious are your opponent's sins against you when compared to that? Again, that's Matthew 18, 21 through 35. And then eight, how can you demonstrate forgiveness or promote reconciliation in thought, in word, and deed? Go on the record with the Lord by writing a prayer based on the principles outlined here. A great exercise to do is to express your thoughts about what's going on, talking to God in that way. And by the way, I haven't brought this up yet, but I've oftentimes even prayed to God by writing out my prayers. It helps you to focus and to really articulate yourself and get your words right. If you're having one of those mornings where you can't think straight at all, I, I commend you, write down your prayers. Just It takes longer, but write them down, type them out. They're not less of prayers if you use a computer. Uh, you know, you can type them out, write them out, whatever that might be. Uh, that's helpful sometimes. Sometimes I'll do that and just delete it. it, it, it I prayed it. It's, it's, it's there. Um, okay. So let's move on to and lead us not into temptation. I want to talk about the difference of testing and temptation. I think that's important because when we pray this prayer, are we being tested by the Lord or are we being tempted by the enemy, by our flesh? James 1, 13 through 16 says, 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. I included this helpful chart by a guy named Dennis Fuqua to highlight the differences between temptation and testing. You can see it right there. You know, not initiated by God on temptation. It is initiated by God when it's testing. Triggered by our own evil desires or brought about by God's desire to grow us. The purpose of temptation to bring us down and take us away from God. The purpose of testing to build us up and to bring us closer to God. One's based on lies, the other on truth. One's designed to lead to death. One's designed to lead to life. A good way of thinking about this is that well, uh, Abraham was tested when God asked him to take Isaac to sacrifice him on the mountain. And Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan. Okay? So those are this one way to think of the difference here. And this section of the Lord's Prayer starts with and lead. I think that's important, which you could make the case is a confession of our desire to follow. If we're asking God to lead, it's our confession, Lord, I need to follow you. And this part of the prayer is also where we acknowledge that we're in a spiritual battle. Right? We need our temporal needs met, our physical needs met, but Lord, I'm in a spiritual battle and I need your help. If we're to follow the Lord as He leads us away from temptation, we need to be realistic about the attacks that are going to come from three different areas. One, our flesh. We see in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And I, by the way, if you never realize this, this is a list that comes right before we see the fruit of the Spirit. You almost get this, here's the fruit of the flesh, here's the fruit of the Spirit. And I think sometimes it's good to take these two lists and use them as an analysis. If you're walking through the gospel with somebody and they're talking about easy believism or they're talking about, I've been a Christian since I was five, but I've just been, you know, kind of wandering off the range with the Lord, you could kind of look at this and say, well, here's the fruit of the flesh and here's the fruit of the Spirit. Which one do you identify with more? Would, would your life identify with more? It says sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this provides a ready-made prayer list. Lord, I, I pray I'm not tempted by these things. I'm, I'm not tempted to uh, follow my flesh in this way. This is what my flesh is kind of designed to do since the fall, not designed by God, but it's, it's, it's fallen and it has this, this pull to sin. It won't one day when we have our new bodies, hallelujah, but right now we're pulled to sin and we need to recognize that to pray for us to not be tempted. The enemy, we have a real enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And then we have the world. The world and its systems, that the prince of the power of the air, the enemy, Satan, he is ruling this world in a sense. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In their case, the god of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so the more that we live in the world, what does Romans 12.2 say? We need to be transformed, not being conformed to the patterns of this world. We, the world is something that we operate in because we can't be removed from the world, but we should not be of it, the scriptures say. How do we do that? How can we pray for God, God and reveal to me, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but reveal to me, am I being entertained by the wrong things? Am I being around the wrong people? Do I need to find a different job? Do I, you know, all those kind of things are part of this prayer. Lead me not into temptation, but let me follow you. Where are you taking me, Lord? Where am I most tempted? You know, some people can be in, in one job and, a whole, and another Christian could, could not be just because they're tempted by different things. And we need to be honest with how our flesh is tempted by the world around us. Now, if we're going to pray, Lord, lead me not into temptation, then we should also investigate where God tends to lead his people when they pray prayers like this. I'm going to skip this and go on to this. How does God help us overcome temptation? Well, God gives us his word, Matthew 4, 3. And the tempter came and said to him, he's talking to Jesus, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. How does he respond? Matthew 4, 4. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Did you know that that's from Deuteronomy 8, 3? 
He's quoting Scripture. And so God gives us His Word to respond to temptation. Secondly, Christ offers sympathy and confidence. And we have a high priest who is not, he, he, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Christ was tempted in every way, far more than we were, because he never gave in. Christ went to the pinnacle of temptation. We usually give up. And we give in to temptation, but Christ never did. And that is a, an amazing thought that not only did he not, but he also sympathizes with us. It should give us confidence. Third, God warns us to be watchful. When the disciples failed to stay awake and be watchful for Christ, what did he tell them? He said in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray that you not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The more that we pray this prayer, the more that we'll be on guard and watchful against temptation. And then you see that uh, hymn by Charles Wesley there. Very helpful way to think about it but we want to get to deliver us from evil. I'll give you a short story here in my business. This was later in my time there. Um, we had a company who wanted us to start producing uh, marketing for LGBTQ stuff through their, uh, through their promotions. They had a company that did uh, debit cards that were designed in certain ways that you could get. So you could get your favorite football team or you could get, you know, um, your favorite logo or whatever it might be on there and at the very end of our interaction with them they wanted us to do something for pride month and we said no and um, i will never forget the phone call i had with their ceo he called me and for four minutes straight on the phone cussed me out and told me that uh, i was a hateful person and i was hiding behind my bible and i'm going to tell everybody in orange county california uh, to not do business with you guys because you're horrible human beings and so it was really the first time we'd experienced bold persecution from for our, for doing what we thought was the right thing to do in our business and i prayed this prayer pretty heavily after that phone call lord deliver us from evil deliver us from these evil attacks that are happening and will continue to happen in our business and i think that's what we're getting at here when we're asking to be delivered from evil we're asking to be delivered from satan in his domain of darkness deliver me from this now regarding evil the core of the prayer here is for deliverance Deliver me. We want to pray for God to remove evil obstructions from doing ministry. That's what we're asking for. The things that get in the way from us doing ministry work. So think of like the enemies that harass us. Like Rab Shaka. You remember that story with he was the Sennacherib's right hand guy and he's just he's saying stuff in front of the Israelites to Hezekiah and trying to rile them up. Lord, deliver us from this evil person, from this evil that is in front of us. Um, and then we think about us having a relationship with the Lord. Lord, I want nothing to get in the way of my relationship with you. Please remove this evil. Paul speaks of this deliverance in 2 Corinthians 1.10. He, he delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. Uh, in, on him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. And how often when we have something like that in our, you know, my flesh, what did it want to do after that phone call? It wanted to go and, and try to solve the problem in a human way. How can I make a complaint? Or how can I go talk about this with other people? Or tell other people not to do business with him? Or whatever it might be. You know, my, my first reaction as a Christian needs to be to go to my Holy Father and say, this doesn't surprise you, Lord. This evil is an offense to you more than it is to me. Please deliver me from this evil. Psalm 91.14 says, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. So as we wrap up, I pray that you will pray the Lord's Prayer. Over these last couple of weeks, we've gotten some ideas of how we can fuel our prayer when it comes to the Lord's Prayer. You know, I would just say use what we've talked about over the last couple of weeks to grow your theology of the Lord's Prayer, but don't stop there. It's meant to be put into practice. This is something that Christ wanted us to pray. I'll let you know this. I've gone for walks. I, I love prayer walks. I'm just someone who can do that. I know not everybody can focus while they're doing that. I've gone for drives. I've been on walks for an hour before where I've, all I've had in my pocket was the Lord's Prayer. You know, just I'm going to recall the Lord's Prayer and I'm going to pray this as a template. And I had more than enough. I could have gone on a second walk and never ran out of stuff to pray. So practice this get good at praying the lord's prayer you'll never be without fuel for prayer without fodder for prayer 
And uh, it served me time and time again. And this is the way that the, the Lord taught us to pray. And so I would, I would also just, I'm going to keep commending you to do this as long as you're in this class and I have your captive attention. Come to the boiler room because what we're doing at the boiler room is living this out. We're living, if you can, not everybody can make it, 740 right in this room each Sunday. Again, we talked about this the very first week, that prayer is meant to be corporate. And that's a big part of our prayer lives. That's the default part of our prayer lives. The church needs to be praying together. If we want to see revival in this valley, I'll, t I'll say it this way, we will not see revival in this valley. We will not see revival in this church. We will not see the kind of revival that I think God has offered us if we don't get our church praying more. And so lead the way. You guys have already led the way by being in this class, but lead the way. Come to Boiler Room. Be a part of that. Anybody who's watching on the camera, come to Boiler Room. Pray as much as you can with the people in this church. It will grow your faith, but it'll also it's where we're going to see God do the work that He's going to do. It's going to glorify Him more and more. So let's pray to end our class time together. Lord, we thank You for this time together. We do pray that this church would be more prayerful not just for the sake of being more prayerful or to somehow to earn a badge or a pin or something like that, but to say, we need you. Help us to be needy people, to really realize how much we actually need you. Give us, Lord, the, the, the strength and the focus and just the conviction, the, the wherewithal in our own minds to, to set this aside as something that important. Lord, whether or not we're here together in the boiler room praying or we're in our life groups, or wherever we're at, in our quiet time alone with you, help us to just never give up seeking to pray more and more in the way that you've taught us to, so that we can grow to be more like Christ, and you can be glorified. We can be needy and reliant on you. And uh, Lord, like we said uh, last week, may we be a people who, when you take us home, whether you return or you take us in death, and we go to be with you, that, that, that wouldn't be whiplash for us. That would be something that we just, we've been in your presence so much through prayer that, that we actually feel that's a, 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 a fitting transition for us into that next life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.